and welcome this morning, Destiny Christian Church, and anyone who is watching by video who maybe you're not part of our church, but so glad to be with you today. And I'm going to be talking today about uh, something I titled Stronger Than Blood. What is stronger than blood? Um, we, we all grew up hearing that saying that blood is thicker than water. And we find that uh, the obsession with family trees and generational roots in modern culture uh, is a testament to the reality that people care about where they came from. And I've done my own, you know, generational root study, you know, on uh, where you pay the, the fee and 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 uh, and you send them a sample of spittle or whatever, <laughs> and they and they tell you, oh, this is where you came from. And uh, but since medieval times, it was said that blood is thicker than water. And that means that family ties are thick, just like blood is, and all other relationships are thin like water in comparison. And so blood is thicker than water, that usually family comes before anything else. And how many of us, however, look back with despair at our roots only to see that, that the family blood that is thicker was sometimes troubled and very dysfunctional. And maybe we look back with shame or embarrassment. And, you know, what if, what if my roots go back to uh, Vlad the Impaler or some evil person that history has really uh, re repulsed that? So the question today I, I want to ask you is, are genealogies important? Is it important to know, to know what your roots are and, and how powerful your roots really are? And in the past, every time I would read Scripture, and come across, especially in the Old Testament, the genealogies where it says, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and it goes on and on and on. I would just skip it and say, oh, yeah, you know, I got a, a free pass today, you know, for half a chapter, and I'll, I'll keep reading. But then I realized when I came to Matthew chapter 1, just how important genealogies are. And what, when I when I came across in Matthew the genealogies, I realized that, that uh that God allowed genealogies to be put right before the birth of Christ, right before the whole story of redemption happened for a specific reason. And so I asked myself, what is that, sta what, what is that saying? What statement is God making by doing such a thing? Well, for me, it showed me that there are some bonds that are stronger than blood. His destiny for you and for me are greater than any bloodline. And that's the magnificent story. That's the power of, of the gospel and the blood of Christ, that it's greater than whatever your lineage is, whether good or bad. Now, in the Old Testament, says Matthew Henry, it begins with the book of dramatic generation of the world. In other words, the world being created. But in the New Testament, it excels the Old Testament because it begins with the book of generation of him who made the world, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's why Matthew is so powerful, because it has that, that generation documented of, of the, the, uh, the, the many generations that happened before Christ, and then Christ came. So why is, why is genealogy so important? And genealogy is another word for your roots and your family line and your blood. Why is gene genealogy so important? Because genealogy proves authenticity. The purpose of genealogy, it is said, is to prove a title and make out a claim. If, if something belongs to me, if an inheritance belongs to me, I have to prove that, that I am in the family line to receive that inheritance. And the design is to prove it in, in, in God's story that our Lord Jesus descended from David and Abraham because that is whole that is part of the whole redemption story. In other words, unless it could be proved that Jesus is the son of David and, and a son of Abraham, we cannot say that he's Messiah. And th this is why every year you see a documentary saying, okay, who is Jesus and was he really real? And you always have these, these people who try to interpret it with a certain slant. But also genealogy confirmed God's promise to humanity. Abraham and David were, in a sense, one of the greatest stewards of that promise in their lives. And God's promise to them uh, would, would, through them, if they stewarded the promise, would touch all of humanity. Here's what I mean. 
God's promise of blessing of all nations was made to Abraham, and God's promise of absolute eternal dominion was made to David and his seed. In other words, David would steward it, but he wouldn't really live to see it because Jesus is the new David in the scriptures. And Jesus, I mean, the Bible is clear when it says he, God has placed all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet. And he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. So the promise to Abraham is in Genesis 12, 3, that says, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then the prophecy to David went something like this in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. Before me, your throne shall be established forever. And so when you, when you see the connection of this, it is amazing that God puts the genealogy of, of all these people in Matthew 1 before he brings the gospel, before he produces Christ. So what's in the bloodline? If you were to read Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, you would see the genealogy of Christ, his family line. And when you see it, you, you kind of like would wince at some of the people that were in there when you, when you study and see who they were. Um, Abraham, for instance, was one of the first ones, and uh, he didn't have a great start because Abraham lied to, to two kings twice uh, about his wife and said, well, she's my sister, she's not my wife, because in those days, if a king saw a woman, and let's say that woman was, was your sister, he would just take her and say, okay, here, here's a, you know, a thousand camels, because uh, that was the culture. I'm not just taking her because I'm sovereign, I have the power, I'm going to take her. So Abraham was afraid that because his wife was so beautiful, that she would be, uh, that he would be killed, and they would take his his wife. So he said, "No, she's she's not my wife. She's my sister." So so think about it. The whole story of God's promise begins with a lie, with with Abraham lying. Uh, his journey begins with him lying, and uh, and later on he even tried to force the promise of God by producing an alternate heir because it was taking God too long, and that was called a Hagar, where he he, he took. His his uh his servant and and had a child through her to try to try to kind of force the promise through manipulation. Um, Isaac, his son, also became a liar. Isaac and Ishmael had a rift between their relationship because Isaac had had stolen his brother's birthright by deceiving Jacob and saying saying I'm I'm Ishmael. You know he he disguised himself and and Jacob couldn't really see. And, and so Jacob blessed him and said, I'm giving you the inheritance. And he stole his brother's inheritance. So th these people had serious issues. Jacob, Abraham's grandson, was called a deceiver or manipulator. Jacob deceived his father Isaac uh, by stealing his Esau's inheritance. And I'm confusing some of these. Forgive me about that. Um, let me rephrase. Isaac lied to his father uh, and Ishmael had a rift in their relationship. So, But Jacob was the one who stole the inheritance, not, not his brother Isaac. But Jacob stole the inheritance from, from Esau, his brother. And there were issues between them for many, many years. And uh, then there was Judah, all right? Here's another one. Uh, here's the family line. And I'm only giving a few of them because there's so many in, in, this, in this chapter of, of Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. But I'm only giving you a few just to show you the kind of line Jesus came from. Then there was Judah. You talk about a guy with issues. Judah was a very violent man. Uh, one time, uh, somebody uh, raped his sister, and he, he and his brothers took swords and killed the whole village. Uh, but also in, his, in Judah's family and his brothers, there, was, there were sexual sins in the Bible that we don't even have time to get into. But then think about Rahab and Ruth. These are two women who had something in common. They were outsiders. They were, they were Gentiles. Rahab was a prostitute in Joshua 2, and she's the one. Why is she in the bloodline? Because she helped, she helped uh, uh, Israel into, into the land, and, and she, she, she opened the door, the gate for them, and she, she made the way. She, she, she informed the spies about what was happening, so she kind of was an informer in a way. And so that was Rahab. But think about it. Jesus had a prostitute in his bloodline. Then there was Ruth. Another Gentile, an outsider, she was a Moabitess. Uh, um, Moabites were considered like, like not only outsiders, but like real outsiders, like no one wants to be a, a Moabite. And according to Deuteronomy 23, uh, 3, 
she was excluded from the nation of Israel because of her lineage. So she too was in the line of Christ. She was in his lineage and mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. Then came the famous King David, who's often seen as a great hero, and he's the icon in the Old Testament, the greatest king ever. But uh, if anybody reads the Bible, you realize that David had some serious, serious flaws and issues. And David committed adultery, and to cover up the adultery, he committed murder, and then he committed the murder so that he can take the man's wife. I mean, talk about serious problems. And David, furthermore, was not only uh, someone who struggled with, uh, with these areas of, of adultery, but he also was filled with pride. There was a time where he, he was boasting on his numbers, on how great he was as a king. And he told his leaders, go number Israel again. I want to see how many, how many people we have. And that was a point of pride. It's almost like saying, I'm going to count all my money in the bank because I'm a you know, billionaire, just so I could feel good about it. And, and God really had a deal with, with David in this area. So, and as a side story to David was one of his daughters named Tamar. And Tamar was David's daughter, and she had deep emotional wounds from incest that occurred from her half-brother. She basically was, was raped by her brother. So, think about this. This was in the lineage of Jesus. I will keep saying that. Because if you think that Jesus, his line was perfect, it was, it was the absolute opposite. And it, in a way, the more I read these, these lineages, the more encouraged I become as a person to realize that, you know what, my family line wasn't perfect. You know, way back there were issues with this person or that person. It doesn't matter because look at Jesus' lineage. He had all kinds of issues in his lineage. But then there was someone named Bathsheba. Bathsheba was was the wife of Uriah, also the wife of David, and the mother of Solomon. And, and there's a whole story just in that description. She was the wife, uh, wife of Uriah, a soldier that was under David's authority. He was the king, and, and he was just one of his soldiers. And, and they were married. And David ended up killing Uriah by, by putting him in the front of the battle so he could die, so he could have his wife. And then she later gave birth to Solomon. And I mean, it's, an, it's, it's like a soap opera, the Old Testament, when you read it. I mean, Jesus' lineage is like a, is like a soap opera, you know, as, as my stomach turns kind of thing. And uh, so, so Bathsheba is the one who committed adultery with David, who murdered her husband so he could have her. Think about this. But then there is a king that... Many people never even heard of, unless you read the Bible a lot. His name was Manasseh. And if you read any history books or any commentaries or anything, they all agree on one thing. Manasseh was the most wicked king in the history of Judah. And, and it said nobody ever sold their, soul, sold their soul to do the wrong thing the way this guy did. And he didn't, know, he didn't just sell a soul, but he, he provoked other people to do it. And he, he led them into it. And his wickedness was so great that it led to the invasion uh, from foreign invaders and then to the captivity of Judah. So this too was in the lineage of Jesus. But then after that, and I haven't given you the scriptures, but these are all in that first chapter, in those first 17 verses of Matthew. But in Matthew chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12, it talks about another phase in, in the lineage of Jesus, which was deportation and slavery. Imagine that, that you get to the point where you become deported and forced into slavery. This is exactly what happened to Israel after Manasseh got hold of the kingdom and, and just brought it downhill. And God says, okay, I'm, I'm taking my hands off of you and I'm going to let the enemy just come in and, and, and uh, take you. But the bloodline that carried God's promise became so dysfunctional that Judah became aliens and slaves in a foreign country for 70 years years. Did you hear that? 70 years. And this is in the lineage of Jesus. This is his roots. This is his family tree. Think about that for a moment. So here's a question again I want to ask you today. What is greater than blood? If, if that's your bloodline and you said, man, maybe I had Vlad the Impaler as my, as my bloodline and I'm horrified, 
What is greater than, than the bloodline? I want you to think about this for a minute. There are literally 42 generations that happened before Christ in his bloodline. And if you split them up into three, there's almost like three chapters in those 42 generations. In the first 14 generations, we have the family of David rising into a golden age where Israel was the most powerful kingdom in the world. In the second 14, right, split it up three ways, 42 generations. In the second 14 generations, the most prosperous kingdom in history under Solomon. And then Solomon slowly began to to bring it downhill with his idolatry. And in the third, there was a massive decline into a small remnant of Jews that ended up under Roman rule. And that's during the time of Matthew. And that ended at the doorstep of an unknown and poor carpenter named Joseph. And it is here where everything shifts. That's the beauty of it. And I think of Isaiah 9 too that, that says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. So the Bible says in Matthew 1 16 that Jacob, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Messiah. So Jacob was basically. Joseph's father, and, and these are different, obviously different Jacobs, Jacobs and Josephs from the Old Testament, but often they had repetitive names, you know, through history. So Matthew 1.16 is where everything turns, because that's where Jesus is born. That, this is where the story is born. And Joseph was the closest descendant to Jesus in the long line that came before. He was a poor carpenter of Nazareth. And as the husband of Mary, he was the legal father of Jesus. So what does the blood tell us? What does, what does the blood of Jesus tell us? If, if blood means, if there, if there are things that mean more than blood and more powerful than blood, what does this long list show us about God choosing men and women of such deep character flaws? I mean, major issues, major, major psychological, spiritual, physical all kinds of wounds. You're talking about messed up. There, there were there were people who were who were uh, alcoholics. There were uh, there were liars. They were deceivers. They were murderers. They were rapists, adulterers. They were incest, incestuous. They were prideful, Id uh, idolatrous, unfaithful, and, and you could just add every sin you can imagine. And that was in the in the lineage of Jesus. And he came right on the doorstep there. What does that tell you? It tells you this, as it has been well said through the generations, faith has a long arm. And that encourages me today to know that no matter where I came from, it doesn't matter because my destiny is in the hands of God, not in the hands of where I came from. Psalms 119 and 90 says, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. Psalms 89.2 says, I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. His destiny for you is greater than any bloodline. That's the point of, of what I'm, I want you to take home today with you, take with you today. His destiny for you is greater than any bloodline. And I'll tell you, my bloodline is far from perfect, just as yours is. I've never been anyone who had a perfect bloodline. And often people establish these, these, these uh, groups that try to keep a bloodline perfect. It'll never happen because we have issues because of sin. And this shows us that God is in control of your circumstances. His will prevails and his purposes will be fulfilled regardless of your bloodline, regardless of who was your father or mother or grandfather or grandmother? It doesn't matter. In fact, Manasseh's son was named Josiah. And, or it may have been Joash. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of it in my, actually it was Joash. And his son Joash was one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had in terms of righteousness. He literally reversed everything his father did. And, and he was just a, a godly king. There's nothing God can't do based 
on my bloodline. And at times, Israel's future stood on the edge of a, on the edge of a knife, that it almost appeared that it was going to collapse and disappear forever. Because of Abraham's lying about his wife, for instance, about his wife being a sister, Sarah was almost lost and taken by another king. And Isaac did the same thing. And at one time, the royal seed was all slain. The enemy had come in. I, I think it was the Assyrians came in and just killed everybody, except for, for a little, little king that was hidden named Joash. So God always preserved his purposes in the human race. And it rem reminds me of Romans uh, 5.20 that says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It doesn't matter where sin abounded in my family or my family roots, or if I was the cause of a problem, God can, can transform those situations. It doesn't matter what my mom said I was or what my dad said I was or anybody in my family did to me or said to me. God knew it. And his purposes in me will prevail if I surrender my destiny to him. It is the Holy Spirit. And this is another thing that shows us that this the bloodline thing shows us that it is the Holy Spirit who conceives the work and fulfills God's promise. And when you read Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through, 18 through 25, that's where Jesus was born. And here's, here's what, I, what I mean by that. Joseph was the legal father of Jesus but not the biological father. Who was the biological father? The Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit overshadowed her, the, the Word said, and it was a supernatural conception. And this encourages me that no matter what I've been through or what bloodline I came from, I can't transform my life in my own strength. It's going to be a work and a birth from the Holy Spirit. He's going to do it because His grace overcomes. God's Spirit can, can work through any bloodline. This is why Paul so boldly said in Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. He goes on to say, for those who He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family, meaning those who are saved. And He ends by saying, and those who He predestined he also called, and those who he called, he justified, and those who he justified, he also glorified. Aren't you glad that that Paul didn't say anything in there to qualify it, saying, "Well, you know, if they came from this bloodline, or, or or they, you know, they did A, B, or C, man, they can't make it. It doesn't matter. The grace of God will overcome any sin or any past that we, any of us have been through." So I want to leave you with this question as we close in prayer today. Or maybe a comment. There was only one bloodline that matters, and that's the blood of Jesus. His blood in your life, what He can do, what He can break, what He will do, will, will eclipse everything that, everything that came before. So have you been maybe weighed down in your life? Have you been uh, to the point where maybe, where maybe you, you are just... Uh, always depressed and, and, and feel like, well, I got this you know, family curse on my life. I've heard that every through, through the years, you know, there's a family curse there. And I don't believe in family curses, and I'll tell you why. Because the blood of Jesus eclipses any curse. And if, if there was a curse on your family and you get saved, does that mean you're hopeless? Think about it. Satan works through sin, through my consent in sinning. He, he doesn't... Somebody can't just cause a curse that, you know, suddenly distracts my life. God's purposes will happen because God is in charge and Satan is not. So don't let that mess you up. Don't let that discourage you or, or in any way uh, bring you to the point where, where, where you can't live your life, where you can't redeem, let God redeem his purpose in your life. So let, let's pray. Can we pray together? Father, thank you for every person who is watching today. And I pray you minister to them in a mighty way. Let your spirit, let your presence, let your power be in every person. I pray you give every person a vision of their destiny. Lord, help us to stop looking in the rearview mirror of our lives, our mistakes, our lineage, our roots, and say, I'm accursed. No, we are blessed in you because your word said it. All the families in the earth shall be blessed in you. 
And Lord, we are blessed because we are in Christ. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, we break off any any bondage to the past, any depression from the past, any fear from the past. And we ask you to set someone free today and to give them give them a new confidence and a new power and a new sense of destiny in you because you can redeem what is now in the name of Jesus. So we thank you, Father. And I'd like to encourage you today to uh, check out our website at destinychristianniagara.com and our YouTube channel and our Facebook and just stay in touch. There are sermons on there and articles and different things and and uh, and be great to to uh, just to hear from you or to you know if 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 you have never seen this before before drop us an email on the website and we can pray for you. So until next time, God bless you and may God be with you.